Hello everybody and welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. In this lecture video we're going to be tackling friction which is something none of you guys have been waiting for. Uh, usually students get excited for the later topics. This is one that you guys probably aren't excited for and that's my fault. I've kind of talked down a friction, talked a lot of crap about friction uh, because it's one of the ones I find students have the most problems with. As you guys are going to see when we look in the theory, friction isn't that tough from a theoretical standpoint. Where friction becomes tough for students is the applications because friction applies to everything. I got my microphone, it has friction. I have my two hands, friction, computer, friction, it's everywhere. So what typically happens is students try to do as many practice problems as possible to get ready for exams. But I guarantee you, you can do a whole textbook of friction problems. Whatever you'll get on the exam will probably be something completely different than what you've seen because again, friction has so many applications. But we're gonna go through the theory and hopefully you guys are saying, you know what Clayton, you talked a lot of crap about friction, but it's actually pretty simple. At least that's what I'm hoping for anyways. Now, before we begin, of course, I hope you guys are all doing well, surviving. At this point, you guys have probably already taken a university exam by the time you're watching this video. So you guys know that it can be tough, right? Let's be honest, university exams are tough. They're not exactly simple. So it can be a little bit uh, demoralizing and a little bit depressing, let's be honest. But keep in mind that even if you have a bad exam, that's okay. Everyone has bad exams. I've had many, many bad exams, more than I can count. The key is to just keep on going, stick with it, you guys will all be fine. I am very proud of you guys, all right? Keep that in mind. Clayton is proud of you guys, even though that means probably next to nothing to you guys. But I'm very proud of you guys. Hang in there. The course is almost done. As you'll see, I think we have like three or four more videos left and we're good to go. So that's kind of the bright side of it. But for now, let's jump into friction. So friction. Friction basically occurs when two bodies come into contact with each other. So one example, of course, the simplest, I have two hands. I bring them together and I try and slide. Well, depending on how much pressure I put between them, it becomes really hard to slide my hands because what happens is when two surfaces come together, a frictional force develops between these two surfaces to resist the sliding. And of course we know this as friction. Now there's actually many types of friction, but we're gonna cover kind of the three most basic and then for the rest of the course, we're gonna focus on one type of friction. So the first one is dry friction. So this is when a frictional resistance between two bodies develop when no lubricant is present. Now I know this is a first year class. As soon as I say lubricant, everyone's, <laughs> nice one, Clayton. Yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. And even though I say it's a first year class and first years are laughing, uh, I'm still laughing, so it shows how mature I am. <laughs> it's, it becomes really hard to teach this class when words like that come up, but what can you do? So basically, dry friction, no lubricant is present. And in this particular case, the friction is proportional to the normal force. As we are going to see, when we have two bodies that come together, the amount of friction between them depends on how much pressure is on that surface. Again, if I were to take my hands and I were to kind of just gently touch and rub, as we can see, it's pretty simple. I'm using words like rub and lubricant. Th th trust me, this is a friction video. I'm not <laughs> getting off topic. But if I were to compress my hands really hard and then try and slide, as we can see, it becomes a lot harder because again, the fr frictional force is proportional to that normal force on that surface. The second type is fluid friction. So this is the frictional resistance between two bodies when the lubricant is present. So what happens is if I were to lube my hands up, again, not that kind of video, <laughs> uh, what would happen is there actually becomes a thin barrier between these two surfaces, which allows them to slide a lot more simply. The problem is, is friction becomes a function of velocity, pressure, temperature, becomes a function of basically everything in life. So the analysis gets a little complex. So we actually don't consider it too much in this course. It's, it's getting too complex. And the last one is internal friction. Now, internal friction is an invisible type of friction, and I put invisible because it's on a very small scale, because, because of course every friction is invisible. When I put my hands together, I don't just see a force appear. Uh, I say invisible because for internal friction, it occurs at a molecular level. So as you guys have taken chemistry, stuff like that, you guys know that actual atoms are arranged in particular orders, and what happens is when those two atoms touch, 
they create friction. Now this, of course, is the most complex type of friction, and it's something that still has a lot of research going into it. Uh, one example from a structural engineering aspect is damping. So what happens in an earthquake is the earthquake will cause the building to move like this, right? But if I were to start a building moving like this and then suddenly stop the motion, what happens is the building will slowly come back to rest. The reason why it comes back to rest is that internal friction or the molecules of the building are creating friction, slowing down the movement of the building. This is a very complex uh, topic, so this is why you won't see it at all in this course. In this course, we are going to focus on the, the simplest one, which is going to be dry friction. All right, so hopefully you guys had all your laughs out of the way because now we're going to get into the actual fun and theory of it. So mechanics of dry friction. To understand it, basically, we have to look at the surface at a microscopic level. If I were to have basically a box on top of a surface and I were to try and push that box, well, it's fairly intuitive to us that we know that there's going to be a frictional force counteracting that motion. So we know that there's going to be a frictional force in the opposite direction of how I'm trying to push my box. But how is this force developed? Well, if I were to take that surface and zoom in on it, what happens is the surface isn't actually perfectly smooth. It's actually a little bit rugged, something like this. So if I had this scenario now, and I try and take that green surface and pull it across the purple surface, we know that there is going to be many uh, points of contact on that surface. And when we have two points of contact, let's say my hands, a normal force develops between them. So at these two points that we have contact, we know that there is going to be a normal force developing at those points. Now here's the key, all right, here's the key. If we were to look at these forces the way that they are, and we were to split them into X and Y components, just like we've done with every other force, we can see that there is actually a horizontal component to these contact forces. That horizontal component, that is actually the frictional force providing the resistance. So this is what happens at a microscopic level. Now, you guys are looking at this and saying, oh, do we have to analyze it at a microscopic level? Well, no, of course not. It gets much more simple. This is just to show you guys where exactly friction comes from. Now, dry friction has a couple of rules, but the rules are fairly intuitive. You guys are gonna look at this and say, Clayton, I'm not an idiot. I know all these rules, that they're pretty simple. The first one is, our contact forces occur in equal and opposite pairs. Basically, if I were to press going to the right on one side, well, my resistance is going to be parallel and to the left, equal and opposite, which is Newton's third law. The second one is the contact forces are generated at every point of contact. Well, that makes sense, right? If there are two surfaces, I'm sick of using my hands, let's go fists now. <laughs> if I were to touch two surfaces together, well, there's going to be a force that develops between it. Fairly intuitive. And then the third one is the contact forces are perpendicular to the contact surface. So I don't really have a surface, but if you guys were to place your hand down on your desk, you know that the normal force is going directly upwards. The desk surface is horizontal, but the force itself is perpendicular to that surface. So again, they're all fairly intuitive. Now, let's say that we had two bodies that had perfectly smooth surfaces, all right? Perfectly smooth. Doesn't happen in reality, but let's say that we do. If we were to look at the contact points, only a vertical force develops because again, they're perfectly smooth surfaces. So as we can see, if we have a perfectly smooth surface, we don't have friction because those contact forces don't have a horizontal component. So as we're going to see, the smoother the surface, the less frictional force it can develop. The rougher the surface, the more frictional force it'll develop. But then again, of course, the question becomes, well, how exactly do we measure this? Well, we do this using friction coefficients. So this is where the actual analysis of friction starts to come into play. But again, it's gonna be pretty simple. You guys are going to laugh and say, oh, this isn't too hard. And then I'll show you the special cases and then you go, oh shit, maybe, maybe it is a little bit hard, but we'll have to wait and see. So let's consider the movements of a box due to a force. So I have a box, it's resting on a surface, and I just wanna push that box with the force P. Now, another thing that's going to come into play is going to be the weight of the box. There is a force, weight, that holds this box downwards on top of the surface. Now, the first force, which is pretty simple, is we're going to have a frictional force. 
And again, its direction is going to try and counteract the motion. So if I'm pushing that box to the right, my frictional force is going to counteract that and act to the left. Now, the next thing that we have is the normal force. And this is why the concept of weight becomes important. If I just put a normal force there and I didn't have a weight force, well, if I were to take equilibrium in the vertical direction, our normal force would be zero. But of course, it's not zero. It's actually proportional to the weight of the box itself. So this is their system. So the question becomes, how do we analyze or quantify this frictional force? Well, it's going to be simple. But again, don't be deceived. It can become quite complex. For this course, our frictional force is going to be a coefficient, which we call mu static or the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. That's it, right? You guys are looking at this and saying, Clayton, it's been eight weeks and you've been talking really dirty about friction, right? You just threw it to the curve, not very nice. And this is all it is? Yeah, it's pretty simple. Again, the theory of friction, not too bad. The applications, that's where it gets pretty bad. So if we were to look at this formula, we can find a couple of things. The first thing is when we apply this frictional force, it is typically directed opposite of motion. So again, if we look at the left, I'm pushing to the right, my frictional force goes to the left. And the other thing that comes from this formula is the amount of frictional resistance is proportional to the normal force. If I were to look at this formula here, it has N. So if I have more normal force, I'm going to have more friction. Again, it makes sense. If I were to lightly touch my hands, well, I can rub them pretty simply. But if I were to compress my hands, well, then it becomes a lot harder to rub. I got two pieces of Lego to show the same thing. If I had two smooth surfaces and if I were to rub it nicely, well, there actually is barely any frictional resistance. But if I were to take again the two same smooth surfaces, compress them, well, it becomes a little bit harder to rub. And when it does break, it's, it becomes pretty violent actually. Kind of, kind of hurt myself there. <laughs> uh, the things I do for you guys. All right, so the last thing we're gonna talk about in this particular slide is that the frictional force is simply the normal force multiplied by that coefficient. So we say, okay, N, that's the normal force, that's not too bad. In this particular diagram, it would be just proportional to the weight. But what about that coefficient of static friction? Well, this is something you'll typically be given or asked to solve for. It's not something that we have a formula to derive because all this coefficient depends on is the two surfaces that are creating friction. So the first one, as we can see for some typical examples, is metal on ice. Metal itself is a pretty smooth surface, and as you guys know, ice is an extremely smooth surface. So if we were to look at the coefficient of static friction between the two, it's pretty low. If we were to go to two rougher surface, let's say wood on wood, as we can see, the coefficient of static friction goes up. It's around 0.35. So the only takeaway here is the smoother the surface, the lower the coefficient. All right, so it's, it's not too bad so far. So sliding friction. The term static is another thing we have to discuss. Remember, in that formula that we had, we said us, and, or mu s, and we said that that is static friction. Now, whenever you hear static, well, you guys aren't too scared because everything in this course is static. But why do we have to specify static? Well, it's because there becomes a point, if I were to take two surfaces, compress them, and then try and slide, there becomes a point where slip occurs and motion occurs. So when actually the motion starts to occur, the coefficient of friction changes after motion occurs. So what happens is we have to analyze a non-static or a dynamic case. If we were to look at the figure on the previous slide and do some of the forces, we know that we're basically going to have P, which is our applied force, minus our frictional force. Now, if this was static, we know that the sum of the forces would be equal to zero. But if we were to analyze a non-static case, we know that the summation of forces is actually going to be equal to the mass times acceleration. All right? This is why I kind of laugh at the mechanical engineers. They always come to the civil engineers and say, ha, you guys always have sum of the forces equal to zero, easy peasy. Well, then I say, well, if it's not equal to zero, it's just mass times acceleration. It's also pretty easy. Uh, they, they don't like that too much. Always be nice to the mechanical engineers, all right? Always be nice to them <laughs> or else they get really upset. So if we were to take this formula and we were to rearrange it and I were to substitute my frictional formula for F where we have mu times N, we get this formula. 
Now, if we were to look at the right hand side, we have mass times acceleration. Basically, we went from a zero value, a static case, to a non-zero value. So that right hand side, it has now increased. Now, if we were to look at the left hand side and we want to try and account for that increase of the right hand side, well, the only way to do that is to have a decrease in our coefficient of friction because P is going to stay the same, mu is going to stay the same. So the only way that we can make that right side increase is if we lower mu, okay? And this is what happens in that dynamic case. We have a coefficient of static friction, which is the friction when our two bodies are in equilibrium, nothing's moving. But once they start moving, we have a coefficient of kinetic friction. Now, if we were to plot this, it's going to look something like this. So I have a plot of applied force versus our developed frictional force. For the first region, which is our static region, we'll see a linear line that goes up to F max. So F max right here, this is going to be the maximum frictional force that can develop before sliding occurs. At the very end here, we have a very uh, important point. This is called the point of impending motion. So if I were to apply just a little bit extra force at this point, sliding is going to start occurring. So this is the maximum frictional force we can develop before sliding occurs. So what happens is after this point, we see a decrease and then we kind of see a constant frictional force which we call the kinetic friction. And this makes sense. If you guys were to take something heavy, and I'm not sure that you can see my desk, but if you were to try and move something, I don't really know what I can move. I, I, I guess I have the Titanic box. I'm not too sure what you guys can see, but just take something heavy and if you guys were to put a force on it, it stays the same. But once you start to move it, the amount of force actually decreases. This has to also do with inertia. Again, if I were to place a force, it's hard to move, but once you start moving something, it continues to move with a lower force. You guys have probably seen this when you lift something heavy. When you lift something heavy, you want to apply a lot of force quickly, and then after that, once you have it lifted, it's actually not too bad after that. Again, this all has to come with friction. Well, it has to do more with inertia too, but we'll talk about that in the last video. So basically, if we were to look at these graphs, we have two different regions. Region number one is static equilibrium. At this point, nothing is moving, and basically the maximum friction we can develop, which is what we call F max, this is equal to our coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. If we were to look at region number two, oops, over here, this is when we have a dynamic case or a kinetic case where sliding is occurring, and our maximum friction resistance is going to be u kinetic multiplied by n. Now I'm going to give you guys personally what I've seen. I've never seen a question test kinetic friction in statics. Again, the name of the course is statics. <laughs> so typically we're only concerned with region one, but again, this is my opinion. I don't know what your professors want to throw at you, so always keep that in mind. Uh, what happens, as you'll see, is the kinetic friction is typically lower than the static friction. As we can see, F max is higher than F kinetic, so uh, the coefficients will be just slightly lower than one another. It's not too bad. So you're saying, okay, Clayton, you've talked a lot, and I mean a lot, you guys are probably getting a little tired of hearing me talk, about the theory, but why is friction so hard? Well, friction is hard because there's a huge variety of friction type questions. Again, my computer has friction, my monitor has friction if I were to tap it, my iPad, my, my hat has friction if I were to put it on top of my head, everything <laughs> has friction. So this is why it becomes hard. Some typical friction questions you will see in this course are force required to make something slide, force required to make something tip, or the first force required to make an assembly move. The key thing here, which I highlighted in red, is basically you're analyzing systems to figure out how much force they can take before they start moving. So if we were to look at this and sum it up, basically all friction type questions require you to assume a pending motion on one of the surfaces. Remember, impending motion, which we talked about on the previous slide, that is the maximum frictional force that can develop before sliding occurs. So that's the whole goal of this course. What is the maximum force I can apply before something starts to move? Let's look back at an example to kind of show you guys what I mean. Let's say that we have our box, our slipping or tipping scenario, 
and I think we covered this back in free body diagrams or something like that. And let's, or I think it was moments. Yeah, it was moments. So if you guys remember from the moments video, we actually kind of talked about this. And let's say that our coefficient of static friction is equal to 0 0.4. Well, we have a box, we have a force P, and of course it has a weight 50, and we're given some dimensions. Now a typical question would say, okay, what is the maximum force this box can take before it starts to move? Now, if you guys remember back from the moments video, this is a very specific case because we actually have two mechanics at play here. If I were to press something, I can make it slide. But remember, when it comes to moments, if I were to press something higher up, I can actually make it start to tip. So this is where friction becomes a bit of a bitch <laughs> because when we look at this, there's a couple different things that we can actually consider at play. But the first things first, we have to complete our free body diagram. As you will see, a lot of friction questions are basically just creating a free body diagram and solving with statics. That's it, it seems rather simple. But again, the applications are where it becomes hard. So if I have a force P going to the right, then we know that we have a frictional force at the bottom surface trying to counteract that. Another thing that we have is if we have a weight coming downwards and our box is resting on a surface, well, the surface provides a normal force to counteract the weight. And we talked in the frictional video that at the point where this is just about to tip, that normal force would actually be at the edge, 0.0. So if you guys are wondering why it's over there, just go back to the moments video. We talk about it more in depth. So again, all friction is, is creating a free body diagram and solving for forces. If I were to look at this free body diagram, I only actually have three unknowns and I have three equations. So things become rather simple. So if I were to go summation of forces in the y, well, there's only two forces in the y direction. We have our normal force pointing upwards and we have our weight coming downwards. So we can say, okay, our normal force is equal to our weight, which is just equal to 50. So this would be kilonewtons, pounds, whatever units you're given. Now, if we were to go some of the forces in the x direction equals zero, this is where it starts getting fun. We know that if I were to consider a horizontal force with no moment, remember, just horizontal forces, we would know that I'm trying to slide the box. So in this case, we have P going to the right and we have our frictional force going to the left. Now the key here is when we're looking at this scenario purely horizontal, we're considering a sliding case. So I would say that this is P slide. And if we were to rearrange this, we know that P slide is directly proportional to our frictional force. And we were saying if this frictional force is just on the verge of moving, or the system was just on the verge of moving, we have the formula where it's equal to mu times n. So we know that mu is 0 0.4, and the normal force is what we solve for above. We can see that our frictional force, or our P force to make this box slide, is actually going to be 20. So again, 20 kilonewtons, 20 pounds, whatever you guys want. But again, this was only considering a sliding case. We said in the moments video that if I were to start increasing that height of P, there becomes a point where this box actually tips rather than slides. So if I were to go summation in the moments about point O, we see that we have uh, our P force times that distance D, the 75, plus our weight times B, that kind of that thickness to the midpoint of our box. And if we were to arrange this, we can find that the P required to make this box tip is 16.7. So if we were to look at this, we can actually say, okay, because our tipping force or the force required to make it tip is lower than the force required to make it slide, tipping will occur before the box slides and it will occur when our P is equal to 16.7. So that again, the, the typical friction type question, what is the force required to make it move? Well, that would be the 16.7. That is the lowest force required to cause motion on this box. And then if you're ever given a box scenario, they'll typically ask, well, will it slide or will it tip? Well, in this case, we know that it is going to tip. So this is why friction becomes hard because you have to start analyzing all the mechanics of different things. Now we're gonna talk about one last thing before I get into the, the special cases, which is I know what you guys all want to see, and that is friction angles. So the normal force and the frictional force can be combined into a single resultant force acting at an angle. This angle is called the angle of static friction. 
Now again, it makes sense. If we were to look at the bottom of the box, we had a horizontal frictional force and we had a vertical normal force. If we were to analyze this from a force perspective, this is basically two components. We have the X component and we have the Y component. But you guys are looking at me saying, Clayton, it looks like you're doing sign language. I don't really care. Show me a picture. Well, I'd be happy to. So let's look at a system in impending motion. We have a force P acting on the box. So of course we have friction counteracting that and we have a normal force. Well, again, if F is my X component and N is my Y component of a uh, resultant force, if you will, we know that the resultant force is going to act something like this. Now, the angle between the normal force, so the vertical direction, and that resultant force, we call that phi s, or the angle of static friction. And if we were to analyze this, well, we know that we were to go tangent of the angle, it's equal to f divided by n, which we know is equal to, or I guess not big f there, that should be the frictional force. Keep that in mind, I'll, I'll correct the notes before I distribute. It's equal to mu s times n, the n's cancel, so it's just equal to mu s. So if I want the angle of static friction, all I have to go is inverse tangent of mu s. And you guys are saying, Clayton, why is this important? What exactly does this mean? It just, it looks like extra work. Well, <laughs> all of engineering statics just looks like extra work, but it actually has some purpose because this is also referred to as the angle of repose. So if I were to take my box and I were to start inclining it, we know that there's going to be a specific point where the box is going to slide down the incline. And this angle is actually going to be phi s. So if I were to incline my surface and my angle is less than or equal to that angle of static friction, my box is going to stay. It's not going to actually slide down that surface. But if my angle of inclination is greater than phi s, so I keep uh, inclining it up, well, my box is actually going to start sliding down the incline. Now again, I always like to tell you guys what to expect on exams. I've never seen this asked. I've absolutely never seen this asked, but it is part of the theory, so it's good to know what it is. And I, I'm always scared, actually, if I'm being honest with you guys, I'm always scared. Because every time I say I've never seen this asked, I know some of the professors watch these videos, and I know some of them go, oh, really, Clayton? This would be a great question to ask. So uh, always keep that in mind. I'm telling you my personal opinion, I have no idea what the professors are going to throw at you guys. Again, I'm not teaching this class this year. Uh, maybe next year, we'll have to wait and see. Now, this is where I typically end my friction theory. And then I go into the examples and hopefully you learn from examples. But again, I'm not teaching this year. So you guys don't have my examples. So the question becomes, okay, Clayton, I looked at this through and through. It doesn't look that bad. Where does it become bad? Well, it becomes bad with special cases. <laughs> so two special cases that you'll see all the time are wheels and wedges. Wheels and wedges. Wedges aren't too bad, but wheels is where it becomes a mess. This is where everyone starts to hate friction. So again, there's special shapes which follow specific frictional rules. The first one is wheels, which again is the worst one. Because remember, when we did that free body diagram, we said, okay, if our force is going to the right, then our frictional force is going to the left. Well, sometimes it's not that easy to see which way our frictional force actually goes. So for wheels, the direction of friction depends on if the wheel is subjected to a force or a moment. So you'll see two different scenarios. And of course, the frictional force changes depending on what scenario you get. So this is the first one that tricks almost every student, unfortunately. So let's look at the case of an applied force. If I were to take a wheel and I were to just pull along its axle, we know that, of course, our frictional force is going to go opposite. If Let's pretend that this wasn't a wheel. Let's just pretend that this was a box. Well, this is the same scenario. If I'm pulling to the left, well, my frictional force must go to the right. Now, for all purposes, I also included the normal force because I know there's going to be some troll in the comments saying, Clayton, you forgot the normal force. Well, no, don't worry, it's here. But again, all we're concerned with in this slide is the direction of the frictional force. Now, here's where the fun comes in. If I were to look, and I'm gonna take my mouse and I'm going to put it on screen, so here's my mouse here. If we were to look at the very bottom of this wheel and I have a force pushing it kind of to the right here, we know that our wheel is going to start rotating counterclockwise like this. Makes sense, right? If I were to pull a car or tow a car, 
we know that the wheels are going to start turning and it's going to have that nice motion. So again, the key here is that the blue thing is our applied force or moment and the dash line, the red dash line, that's our direction of motion. So you guys are looking at this and saying, Clayton, I thought you said it was hard. Come on, bro, this is as simple as it gets. Well, this is where it starts getting tricky. And again, this is where it trick everyone. This was an applied force. What about an applied moment? So if you guys think about actual automobiles, cars, whatever, we don't pull them. Of course, when they break down, you have to tow them, but we don't pull them. What happens is the, ax the axle turns and what actually happens to these wheels is they have a moment. They have a moment. Now here's where the fun begins. I'm gonna bring my mouse on screen. So if we know that this is rotating counterclockwise and we were to look at the bottom right here, we know that the frictional force wants to resist this motion. So if I were to look at the very bottom, it is going to the right. So we know that in this case, our frictional force is actually going to the left. To the left, isn't that crazy? This is where friction becomes so mean. It's going to the left. And of course I drew in my normal force. Now you're saying, Clayton, why is it going to the left? Well, let's think about this. If we were to do summation of forces in the X direction, horizontal right now, we can see that our only force is our frictional force. So if I want to create movement, we actually need that frictional force. Think about this. You guys ever go to the McDonald's parking lot after high school and all those skids are doing burnouts? Those burnouts? What happens is, is they're not creating any friction because they're going too fast. Without friction, you have a burnout because the car is not really going forward. But what happens is you need that friction to propel forwards. If we were to go summation of forces in the X direction, we have our frictional force and nothing else. So in order to create movement, we need that frictional force. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Now you guys are saying, Clayton, what about this? Why is our wheel still going to the left if our frictional force is going to the right? Well, as you'll see, our force P, in order to create movement, it is greater than our frictional force. So our resultant force is still going to the left in both of these cases. It's one of those really, really mean things. So this is why it becomes really weird. <clears throat> Hopefully I cleared this up for wheels. Uh, the second one, which is of course the easier one, is going to be wedges. So the key to wedges is the frictional force on both sides must be in the same direction. Now I know you're looking at that saying, Clayton, I don't know what that means. I don't know either. Let's look at an example. So let's say that we had two uh, kind of boxes on top of each other. Again, this would be a very common case. And it's going to ask is what is the force P required to cause motion? Well, if we were to look at a free body diagram of the bottom box, we say, okay, we have a force going to the left. So we know at the bottom, our frictional force must, or I guess the force is going to the right. Our frictional force must go to the left. That's intuitive. But remember that we have that second surface on the incline also creating friction. And this is where students might go, well, I don't know which way that one goes. Well, again, the key to wedges is the frictional forces must be in the same direction. So if F1 is going to the left, well then F2 must also go to the left. Now this is great because we, if we were to analyze the, the light blue box, we know that the frictional force on that box must be equal and opposite. And this is why these friction questions become tricky. Because if I were to analyze the force P, and I'm gonna bring my mouse back on screen, well, we know that we have to solve it using this free body diagram. But there's a problem because if we were to look at P, we know that we have, I guess even P is an unknown, so we have five unknowns. So in this type of scenario, what you typically have to do is go to this free body diagram, solve for F2 and N2, and then in this free body diagram, now that you know these two, you can then solve for P. So this is why friction gets really complex is because typically it's not just one situation, it's multiple situations. One that they love to throw at you guys is a wheel connected to a box. So of course you have to analyze the wheels movement, but then you also have to analyze the box. And remember that we said boxes can either tip or slide. So there's actually three different cases. Does the wheel move? Does the box tip? Or does the box slide? So this is why friction gets really, really gross. So this leads me to my next thing is when we have multiple objects. So this is where I'm going to give you guys probably 
the biggest trick of all when it comes to friction. Most of the friction questions you'll see involve multiple things. It's not just going to be a single box or a single wheel. It's going to be multiple things interlinked to each other. And again, the question will be is, what is the force required to basically begin the motion? So let's say that we had this scenario where we had basically two links connected to two boxes on surfaces, and we were to apply a force kind of to the middle of the link. Well, intuitively, we know that this is basically going to create three systems. We have the system in the middle where we have P, F1, and F2, and then we have two systems for our boxes which are going to have friction. If we were to look at the purple box, we know that F1 is going to try and cause horizontal movement to the left, so our frictional force is going to go to the right. If we were to look at our blue box, our force is trying to push it to the right, so our frictional force is going to the left. So it seems pretty simple where you're thinking, okay, well all I have to do is just solve for P using that nice frictional formula, but here's the trick. If you guys want one thing from this video, please take this in mind, or take this from the video, I don't know what I'm saying, it's this. It is very, very unlikely, this is gonna get students, it's very unlikely that the blue box and the purple box are going to slip at the same time. Remember that formula that we have, F is equal to mu times N, that is assuming our box is just on the verge of slipping. If we were to look at this scenario, if you guys were to think about real life and I were to press on things, one thing is going to slip before the other thing. So we can't use this formula on both of the boxes. We have to use it on one and then solve for the other one and vice versa. So this is what the steps would be, uh, my personal steps. There's many different ways you can do this, but this is how I personally do it. I assume one system slips, all right, just one. Not both of them, just one. So what I said is I'm gonna pretend that F1 slips, so we know that F1 is equal to mu times N1. Basically this system on the left over here. If I now know what F1 is, well then I can solve the system using equilibrium. Remember, all the friction is using equilibrium. Some of the forces in X, Y, and Z. Because now that I used equilibrium, I can solve for N1 as well as F1. All right, so I assume that one system slipped and I solved for all the forces in that system. Now that I know F1, I can actually use statics to determine the forces in the other system. So if I were to look at this system right here and I now know what F1 is, I can solve for P and I can solve for F2. And now that I know what F2 is, I can move on to the third system and I can solve for the frictional force F2 and N2 using only statics. That's the key here. I just solved for F2 here using only statics. I didn't use this formula. This is a big no-no. I solved this one using statics. All right, there's, there's the trick. Now, once we do that, we have F2 solved through with statics. And all we're going to do is we're going to compare it to our maximum friction limit of mu times N2. So again, I know what N2 is now. All I have to go is mu times N2, and then I basically get two values. If I find that my frictional force is, let's say, 10 kilonewtons, and my maximum is 20, we know that yes, this is not going to slip. Our assumption was correct. So. If F2 is less than F2 max, our assumption is correct, we're good to go, and whatever value of P we got, that, that's our value of P, that's good to go. But let's say that we solve for F2 using statics and it was 30 kilonewtons, 30, and F2 max was still 20. Well, we know that in this particular case, the box has already slipped. So in this case, our assumption was wrong. Our assumption was that the system, or the purple box, slipped first, but in actuality, the blue box slipped first. So now that we know that the blue box actually slipped first, we have to go back and we have to use the formula F times, or F is equal to mu times N on the blue box and then back calculate the P. So this is where it gets gross. If you make a wrong assumption of what slips first, you're gonna have to start recalculating things. Now, I know a lot of you guys are saying, well, Clayton, this is dumb. What I could have done is I could have analyzed this system and then found P and then separately, I could have analyzed this system and then found P and then just figure out which P is lower. And that is correct. Again, there's many ways of solving these things. But keep in mind that this system over here and this system over here, 
they were fairly independent of each other. What happens if I had a third link going between these two boxes? So now this system is connected to this system directly. So this is why it becomes really hard and this is why I prefer my process. Again, if you guys have a way that suits you best, go for it 100%. Always do what's best for you guys, always. I know it sounds selfish, but it's true. Always do what's best for you guys. This is why I do it in my system or in my series of steps because it doesn't matter what's coupled to what, it'll always work. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. And with that, that is friction. So again, it sounded really bad. I always talk down on friction, but hopefully it wasn't too bad. You guys are looking at this saying, Clayton, it's not too bad. Perfect, that's what I want to hear. If I can make your guys' lives easier, that's all I want from this course or all I want from these videos, stuff like this. Now, I'll be real with you guys as structural engineers, and we don't use friction too much. <laughs> so if you guys are really hating this and you wanna become a civil or structural engineer, uh, you don't have to worry about friction too much. If you design a building to rely on friction, I, I wouldn't wanna be in that building, <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Uh, there are certain applications, medical buildings. Uh, medical buildings, you don't want any movements at all. If we were to have even the slightest movement, it would start impacting the medical equipment, like a CT scan. You don't want a CT scan moving because it's so advanced that any movement would actually perhaps disrupt the internal stuff. I can't speak for mechanical engineers, but I would assume that they use friction a lot more than us structural engineers. So it has its purposes, but if you guys want civil, you guys won't have to deal with friction too much, which is good. Now, again, I'll say this at every video. If you guys are thinking, ah, oh, this sucks, I could use some examples. Well, don't worry, I'll have some examples down below to really help get you guys familiar with friction. Again, that's all I want. I want you guys to feel comfortable with the content. So when the exam rolls around, you guys are laughing, saying, ah, Clayton had me nice and ready, or at least that's what I'm hoping for anyways. We'll have to see what happens. So yeah, that's it for this video. I wanna thank you guys all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.